This morning we're going to begin a new series that we're doing on hope. And if you guys remember back in the spring, actually, we actually voted as a congregation to change our name to hope. And we went through this whole process. And, you know, since the months since, I've just become more and more convinced that God has given us this message, this kind of new message to the community around us to share hope with them. And hence all the missional stuff that we're doing through the series and all that stuff. But one of the ways, that, one of the reasons it really hit home, I guess, is I have a niece that goes to school in California and to college. And when we were going through the name process, she actually asked 10 of her flatmates, you know, I think we had three names at the time we were looking at and stuff like that, and kind of went through the different ones. And she goes, which one did you name a church if you could name a church? And so she asked them all, and they all came back with the same answer. And they go to, I think, University of San Diego, right? So um, not necessarily a Christian organization, but, you know, there's people there. All the kids she asked, interestingly, though, had parents that had gone to church at one point, but not since they'd been alive. They had left the church at some point, so they had never been to church. And so it's that kind of perspective. And they all came back with the same one, and it was hope. And she asked each one of them, why hope? Because that's the one that resonates. And I thought, you know, throughout my whole, I started ministry in 1997, and the hope's name has been around at different churches over time, but I don't think it's ever resonated as much as it does in our culture right now today. Truth is, we're living in a very different world than we were in 1997 when I entered ministry. Uh, there's more things that are happening that, I, to me, don't make sense. There's all sorts of stuff that are concerning at, from a biblical front that are going on in our culture today. And, and I keep hearing people say, I hope it changes. I hope it comes back to the way it was. I hope this is better tomorrow. I hope if we elect somebody, they, they do this. Or I hope if we keep this person, they does this. Or, or whatever the deal, I keep hearing the words hope over and over and over. And I think it's, it's just a name that resonates in a different way today than maybe ever before. And one of the crazy things is, well, okay, we're calling our name Hope, and that's a cool thing. And, but it doesn't really mean anything so often in a biblical perspective or connecting them to the true hope like it did maybe when you were a little bit older. I'm 54, and so most of the people I entered into ministry with, right, we grew up in churches, we ministered to churches that had people that had always gone to church or people that had left church and came back. That was our culture. Most people had left and and either you left or your parents left or maybe your grandparents left, but you had some connection to the church. Our world today doesn't have that connection. They don't have parents that went to church. They don't have grandparents that went to church. And so when you talk about hope in a biblical, in a Christian context, they don't know what you're talking about. And so one of the reasons I think it's important to look at hope is so that when we share this message, we actually have something to talk about that resonates with the people around us. And we got to do the long conversation. Mike and I keep talking about we got to do more and more long conversations today because people don't know the word of God. So you've got to explain through the reasons why we take this stance or this stance or believe in these different things. And so I'm going to give you a simple answer to hope, and then I'm going to give you a more complex one over the course of this series. But the simple answer is our hope is in Jesus. Again, that's an awesome thing, period. That's it. He saved us. He forgave us. He pursues us with his love even to this day. Our hope is absolutely found in Jesus Christ. But again, the question that the world keeps asking is, okay, why is our hope in Jesus Christ? And the answer to that is a little bit more complex, but it's also transformative and it's powerful and it's hopeful and it gives encouragement, it gives peace, and it gives all sorts of these amazing things. So as we go through the course of this series, I want to equip you with what hope is so that when you start sharing with people around you, and again, let me just pause there for a second. I think for a while when some of the crazy really ramped up, it was hard as a Christian to share your faith. I think the, the stuff that you saw in the media, the labeling a hate group and all that kind of stuff because we were sharing the message of Jesus Christ, although peace and goodwill and forgiveness and love, I, I don't know how that all factors in. But what's interesting about all that is we live in a time right now where things have gotten so crazy that people are getting open to hearing something that gives them true hope. So when we look at that more complex answer, we're going to start with one of the first definitions that Jesus gives us on what this whole thing is. And the first definition is Jesus gives us a second chance. I'm going to explain through that a little bit. Because one of the facts I think we all need to deal with in life is that all of us, every single one of us, experience failures at different fronts. Life is not an unbroken series of victories, not even for the Kansas City Chiefs who just again lost to my Lions for the second year in a row. I'll take it. It's preseason. Whatever. But... (laughs) But we all have these setbacks, right? We all have these failures, these defeats, these losses in life. And the reality is that every one of us makes mistakes. 
And, and I think we get that. We hear that. Okay, Pastor Mike, we're tracking, right? Obviously, I do some things that are wrong. But even though we hear that, there are some defeats that we just can't seem to get rid of, some defeats that tend to overwhelm us, some defeats that just kind of linger on. And I think Job felt that way in our text this morning. It says in Job 17, 11, my days have passed, my plans have shattered, and so are the desires of my heart. There's seasons that we go through, isn't it? You go through a divorce and there's a season of pain and heartache and everything's got blown up and you're worried about what's next and you're freaking out about all the realities that are flooding in on you. You lose a child and your whole life is upended. Everything has been about that kid since they've been born because they've demanded it, right? But now all of a sudden they're not there and you don't know what to do. You get laid off from a job or fired from a job and all of a sudden the financial realities are flooding in you like never before and you don't know where to go from there. All of us have had these defeats in life or struggles in life that just, I don't know, it hits us and we get stuck along the way and it, it makes us miserable. So I'll just ask you, have you ever felt like that? My days are past, I've been left behind, my plans are shattered, and all the desires in my heart are the same way. Really, is that everybody experiences these kind of defeats in life. Everybody has these failure moments in life. Paul says everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. We're all messed up. But Paul also says that you're never a failure until you give up on Jesus. And that's what I want to take a look at this morning. How do we overcome the past so that we can truly experience this hope that Jesus wants to give us, that Jesus has promised, this new beginning, this fresh start, this second chance that he's promised us in his word. And there's actually a process that it, through it. I, I'll call them steps today, but it's a process, a pathway that God gives us to experience these second chances in a real tangible way versus just having this idea, okay, yeah, he forgives us, we begin again, those kind of things. And each one of these is hard, but each one of these is crucial to the next stage that you have to go through. And so let me just start with the first one. And this is a little bit countercultural, but this is what scripture says all the way through. We start by accepting responsibility for our own failures. This is called the repentance step. In Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. In other words, all the way through Scripture, God calls us to repent. All the way through Scripture, the first step is to admit it and to say, I blew it. I was wrong. God, I did this, and it was wrong, and I know you know it, and I know it, and, and I'm so sorry that I did this. It's complicated this relationship. It harmed that person. It's made my life a mess over here. I'm so sorry, not just for the consequences, but that I let you down. This is where you're honest with yourself, and you're honest with other people. And why is that so important? Because if you want healing in your life, you've got to get to honesty. You've got to get to reality. You can't keep living in this pretend world. Most of us don't like to do that, though. And so we become experts at passing the buck and blaming everybody else for our stuff. It's our natural sin nature to pass the buck. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the snake, and ever since we've been passing the buck in some form of, or another. There's actually a famous NFL coach named Frank Reeve, and he said this, Losers are pros at blaming other people. To blame is to be lame. But losers are pros at passing the buck. And it's true, it's hard to move forward if you're always blaming somebody else for your stuff. So we blame the economy, we blame the weather, we blame fate, we blame luck. If you're a non-Christian, you blame astrology, you blame your parents, you blame your spouse, you blame the government, right? You blame anybody else that you possibly can because you don't want to deal with what is. Went golfing for the first time in a long time the other day and had a lot of fun, but my actual golf game was, was pretty rough. And I'm sure during the course of that afternoon, I blamed just about everything I could. I blamed the sun that was in my eyes. I blamed the wind that was coming across as I was shooting. I was blaming the dust on my clubs because it had been so long since I used them, the old grips that were going. I think Mike, Mike probably looked at me funny, so I was blaming him for stuff, all sorts of stuff. But God says, if you ever really want to start over, if you've ever failed, you've got to start by admitting it. This is where you become vulnerable to God, humble before him. This is where you throw away the pretense and you just say, God, it's just me and you, and I know you know, and I'm sorry. I don't know where we get this idea that we have to be perfect all the time. I mean, the truth is, I'm not, you're not, we're, we're just not. In 1974, after an 88-game winning streak, UCLA basketball lost to Notre Dame, which is adding insult upon injury, if you ask me. But they lost a game that they had been ahead in by 11 points at one point. The next day in the headlines, John Wooden, the famous coach, said, blame me. Not blame this or blame that, but blame me. That's the mark of a winner, I think. He doesn't pass the buck. He said, you know what? We got overconfident. We just did. 
You know, we stopped looking at the little things. We stopped focusing on the stuff that made us great. We just got overconfident. But number one is you accept responsibility for your own failure. And once forgiven, you go to the next step. I want to pause just here for a second and just ask you, when you truly forgive somebody, how long after that do you think about what they've done? Answers, you don't think about it at all. If you've truly released it and forgiven somebody, you're done being mad at them, right? You're, You're just done. How much more so when God says you're forgiven, are you released, are you freed from that? He doesn't think about it, doesn't worry about it anymore. The trick always in this forgiveness thing is once given, do you receive it? Can you understand that you worrying about it is silly because they're not worried about it anymore? But one of the things and and one of the parts that's super important in this step is not just accepting responsibility but truly receiving the forgiveness that God has for you. You are wiped clean. You are fresh as, you know, newly fallen snow. You are not looked at as a sinner, but as redeemed because of Jesus. So often, I think we, get, we stay in this bondage to the past, don't we? We stay in this bondage because of stuff that we've done. It, it continues to, to haunt us and mess us up. And so after you've accepted responsibility, you've got, and you've got to do that and receive that freedom from that past to do this next step, which is forget the former and focus on the future. Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, it says, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Forget what's behind and focus on what's ahead. I press on, I don't let my defeats defeat me, he says. And so let me just ask you, because I think the past so often holds us in bondage in different ways. What memory are you holding on to? What hurt are you holding on to? What sin are you holding on to that you're allowing today to still manipulate you? Every time you think of it, you think, I wish I wouldn't have done that, said that, experienced that, I regret that. And you're manipulated. It causes you to act in different ways, treat people in different ways than you otherwise would, cave in in areas that you would never cave in. What did you say to your kid that he keeps using over and over to manipulate your decisions right now? What did you say, I don't know, to your spouse that she keeps using his leverage or he keeps using his leverage to get their way because of some past sin? What are you being haunted by, manipulated still in the present? Truth is, some of you are allowing your past to control your future. And God says, that's a huge mistake. I have freed you from that stuff. I have released you from that stuff. Your past is past. It's actually the whole point and the good news of the book of Romans, right? Your past is past. It's water under the bridge. You can't change the past by worrying about it, so why do you keep doing it? God says, let go. Let go and focus on the future. Again, when you forgive somebody and you actually let go, you don't worry about it anymore. When you actually let go of your past, you find the strength to not worry about it anymore, not be manipulated by it anymore, not struggle with it anymore. And to be healthy and move forward with what God wants you to be and all that kind of stuff, you've got to release yourself because God already has. You've got to experience that freedom because it's not so much where you've been that matters. It's where your feet are headed right now that counts. And so he says, focus on the future. Forget the former. It's actually a biblical principle. But the past doesn't control you any longer. And and just as an example of this, let me just walk through Peter and Judas a little bit. If you think through their stories, they both denied right? Christ in different ways. One turned him in, one pretended he didn't know him. In Matthew 26, we have this classic example of two men responding to failure in totally different ways. And they denied their Lord, right? They turned him in. They saw the, the consequence of those actions. They, they saw him being strung up on the cross. They watched him die. Both Peter and Judas were disciples. Both Peter and Judas denied Christ. Both Peter and Judas were devastated by their own failure, but they responded to that failure in completely different ways. You look at Peter, and Peter denied Christ three times as the rooster crowed. And as you go through the book of John, you see that Jesus and him locked eyes, right? Right as he denied him that third time. And then the rooster crowed. In verse 75, it says, Immediately the rooster crowed, and then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. Just imagine how Peter was feeling at that moment. I mean, it's not just that moment either. As he was crying, as he was going through this grief, as he was going through all of it, he watched his, his friend, his Lord, die, the one that he had just professed he would never let down ever. 
Here's a guy who had been with him for three years and he found that even he didn't have the strength, even when God warned him in advance that he would be tested. Someone says to him, are you a disciple of Jesus? And he says, oh no, I'm just, I'm just here for the potato soup, man. You know, I don't know, you know. He was so disappointed in himself. His self-esteem was not at a high point. He felt like a complete failure. He had let his Lord down and he says, it went outside and he wept bitterly and he must have prayed, God, I'm so sorry. Can you forgive me for this? Can you ever use me again? I'm so sorry for what I've done. And he just wept and he confessed and he repented over and over and over because he, God was real and because Jesus was real and he was the Messiah and this is what he did to him. I totally let you down. If you can imagine Jesus coming to him at that point, he probably would have said, buddy, you didn't let me down. You just didn't hold me up. Then you look at Judas as we focused our attention toward him and he experienced a similar kind of sorrow, but it was more of a worldly sorrow. Chapter 27, verse 3 says, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse, right? Contrition, and returned the 30 coins to the chief priests and said, I've sinned. I betrayed innocent blood. But the priest said, oh, What's that to us? That's your responsibility. He needed to hear the words, You're forgiven. It's just going to the wrong place. So Judas, not believing that Christ was truly Lord, threw the money into the temple, and he left, and he went out and hung himself. One commits suicide, one repents bitterly. And I'm sure Peter must have thought, can I ever be used again? And yet on Easter morning when Jesus appears, right, and, and Mary's at the tomb, and he's talking to Mary, he says, hey, Mary, go tell the disciples. Make sure you tell Peter. I think that's sometimes lost in the midst of that story, but make sure you tell Peter. Why was this such an important statement? Why did he single Peter out? Because Peter must have thought, I'm just worthless. God could, I don't know if he can forgive me. I know he can forgive me. I just don't know if he will forgive me for what I've done. I, I don't know that I can be used again. I don't know that I should be called one of his disciples. I've let him down in so many different ways. He needed a special word of encouragement. And so Jesus said to Mary, make sure you tell Peter. And Peter repented. And he got to experience Jesus' forgiveness, and it changed him. And the same man who had denied Jesus three times before he went to the cross was the same man that Jesus used not 50 days later on the day of Pentecost to preach to 3,000 people that were saved. Truth is, he preached away more than that. And he preached out in public, and he preached with the Pharisees watching, and he condemned them for their role in Jesus' death. He wasn't hiding anymore, and 3,000 people were saved truth is you're not washed up unless you choose to quit, unless you choose to give up, unless you choose to reject the grace and the forgiveness of Christ. But the choice has always been that. It's been condemnation or it's been confession. It's those two things. You can wallow in these haunting things from your past over and over, continue to condemn yourself over and over, be beat up and manipulated continually by your past, shackled to the past and bondaged by your past, or you can confess it and be released so that you can focus on the future. Again, you can either live in condemnation or you confess it and get on with the rest of your life. Again, this is the whole point. Forget the former and focus on the future. But do we believe in a God that can forgive our sins? The answer should be yes. Let him. And just like you can forgive and let go, let go of that stuff. God gives you permission. He died for you to give you that permission. And then let it rip your focus instead of on the past toward the future and what's best. But as we focus on the future, what do we do? We get freaked out about the unknown. It's one of our greatest fears. And so step number three comes in and it's this. You need to trust God to work it all out. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that to those who love God and who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into his plan for good. It's actually a promise he gives us in Romans 8. Do we believe that God can do anything? Yes, we believe that God can do anything. Do we believe that he has all the power to do anything he wants? Yes, he can speak things into happening. It's crazy. Will you trust him with your future? And I use trust instead of faith because it's a different word for us for some reason. It means the same thing. Will you trust God for your tomorrows? Will you trust God for your next weeks? Will you trust God for the years to come? Will you actually trust that he's got it? Or are you going to continue to freak out every time you watch the news? I wonder today if anybody here can ever, has ever done needlework. I have not, but I think it's a really cool example. If you've ever done needlework, you know that the backside is a tangle of threads and knots. It's a mess. 
But on the other side, it's this beautiful picture that's being done. I think many of us, as we focus, as we go through this life, right, to use this illustration, we focus on the underside. That's all we can see. We see knots and we see threads going everywhere. And we're like, what is happening with my life? This is crazy. I don't understand a thing. It doesn't make any sense. But God's looking at it from the top side, from his point of view. And he's working out a pattern in the fabric of our lives that's just beautiful. It all fits together. It's all working toward his purpose. But sometimes from the bottom perspective, right, we just don't get that. It just looks like a big jumble of mess, and we think that he doesn't see or he doesn't know or he doesn't care. We look at our lives and we think, how can anything come that is good out of this? You know, I used to worry about the source of where my problems came from a lot more than I do today. Um, I used to wonder if, you know, they were caused by the devil or they were caused by other Christians or they were caused, maybe the Lord brought them in my life or maybe I was just the, the, the X factor in all the mess, right? Usually it was the last one, of course. But the longer I've be, been a Christian, the more I understand now, I think, that I don't really need to worry so much about where they come from. Because even in my rebellion, even in the things that I do that I know are not God's will, even in the mess that so often I make my life, I know that somehow, way, God can and does use that mess and make something good out of it. Doesn't mean that everything's preordained, man. We mess up a lot of stuff. We have we cause God to have to reshuffle the deck all sorts of times to try to make good out of the messes we continue to make. But man, does he have the ability to come through again and again and take that garbage pile that we've made and turn it into something good. His way of overriding our mistakes. His way of taking the bad and somehow working in such a way that good results. He just has a way of working it all out. And he's proved this again and again as you go through the pages of Scripture. And he's proved this again and again as I look at my life. It's something he does over and over. And so it seems like I should be able to trust him with my tomorrows better than anybody. So he just says, trust me. Trust me, Mike. And man, would I get rid of my stress. And man, would I get rid of my worry. And man, would I get an overwhelming peace if I could just do that. In fact, you read through the heroes of the Bible in Hebrews 11, and all these guys at different points of their life were losers. I mean, seriously, heroes of our faith were adulterers and murderers and liars and cheats and swindlers and weak-willed, wishy-washy people. You know, the backstory of some of the people in here, just like them, you'd be like, oh my goodness, praise God you're in church, right? But yet God just uses people. That's the truth of it. Truth is, if only God only used perfect people, not much would get done. The fact is he uses us in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our problems, in spite of our faults, in spite of the mixed motives that so often that we have. He uses us. And I think that's what he wants to say to us this morning, right? He says, I want to take your greatest failure, the area of greatest failure that you keep holding on to and you keep struggling with and you keep allowing to manipulate your present. And I want to turn it into one of your greatest strengths. He wants to make a life message out of it. And he does that a lot, actually. You look at Moses and we see that one of his weaknesses was anger and pride. I guess that's two of his weaknesses. God kept him out of the promised land actually because of his anger and pride. He broke the tablets, he, he hit the rock, he killed the Egyptian, all sorts of stuff. Yet it says Moses, Moses became one of the meekest men in all of history, the exact opposite of his greatest weakness. Abraham, Joseph, Paul, weakness and strength. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Jonah 3.1. And you know the story of Jonah, the reason he was eaten by the great fish is because he rebelled against God, right? And so in chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. This time you're going to do it right, Jonah. This time you've learned your lesson and you're going to go forward. I pray as we go through life, we learn lessons and we were wiser than we were when we were younger and, and we can trust God with more and more and more in our life. I pray that going to church isn't press repeat, repeat, repeat and doing the same thing over and over, but that it's growing you every single time you come in here and helping you trust him with more and more as you go through life because God is the God of this second chance and he loves to give people second chances and third chances and hundred chances and millionth chances and God never gets tired of forgiving because of Christ. And you say, well, he must get tired of forgiving. Well, think about it. If you see your kid and he makes a horrible mistake or he does evil and he comes back to you and he says, Mom, Dad, I'm so sorry for what I did. Please forgive me. Are you jazzed? Not by what they did, but you're jazzed that they realized it was evil and they're coming back to you. And every time we come and we humble ourselves before him and we say, God, I messed up again. Please forgive me. He says, absolutely. So do you want a fresh start? 
Again, it doesn't matter what you've done. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, For if a man is in Christ, he becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Jesus specializes in new beginnings. It's never too late to start over. And the Bible calls being born again. So how does Jesus take a negative and turn it into a positive? How does he take a minus sign in our life and turn it into a plus sign? And the answer is he makes a cross out of it. He has this amazing way of turning crucifixions into resurrections. He's done it before. God was nailed to the cross 2,024 plus years ago, right? So that he could forgive your sins, release you from the bondage of the past, give you a new beginning and a fresh start, be one that you could count on for your future so that you could quit nailing yourself to the cross because of your guilt. You say, I've wasted so many years. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten away. If you've ever pressed pause on life and just grief or just misery or just rehearsing the past, it feels like the locusts have eaten away that part of your life. I think it's a beautiful verse. Isaiah 61.1, I will restore beauty from ashes. And so too does Jesus say to you this morning, you guys are forgiven. Let me forgive you. Let me release you. Let me free you from that stuff. I give you permission. I died for you on the cross. Receive this fresh start, this new beginning. And you know, if you walk through these steps and you actually let them do this, you receive that tangible new beginning. The future all of a sudden looks different. All of a sudden you're freed from all the junk. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the stuff we get excited about. And it is hope that we experience as we're going through that thing. This is the hope that our world needs. They don't know there's one that can do anything. They don't know that there's one that's working behind the scenes for our good and his glory. They don't know that there's one that can forgive and actually free us from the past. They don't know. So this is the hope we've got to share. And I think we've got a window here where we can actually share it with people and they'll listen. Because the world's broken. And even at University of California, San Diego, hope resonates. So go with that encouragement today. Let me pray. God, we love you so much, and we thank you so much for Jesus. And I mean, this is the gospel stuff we talked about today, but it's such a fundamental part of the reason that we hope in you. It's freedom, it's forgiveness, it's peace, it's strength, it's hoping in a future that we know you've got. In the midst of everything that's happening in life, Lord, let us cling to that hope, that new beginning that peace that you give. And we pray that in Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen.